Hello! Welcome to this BAFTA Games live stream, live from Creative Assembly. My name's Douglas Pennant, and I'm going to be talking today about colorblindness in games. We've joined up with BAFTA Games for this live stream as part of their BAFTA Crew Games program, a network for those currently working in the games industry to have access to BAFTA, winning, BAFTA award winning talent and nominees. Creative Assembly has been nominated for over 15 BAFTA awards during our 30 years of developing games. And we often support BAFTA in their work to inspire more young people into game dev careers. So I'm going to talk for a while, but please do add any questions you have to the chat. And where I can, I will try and get to those and answer them as I'm going along. And then at the end, once I've finished the slides and everything, I'll do a longer, more sustained focus on all the questions and any other Q&A. So please keep the questions coming. All right, let's get into it. So. A uh, quick introduction as to who I am. So I started my game career as a QA tester. So first at Microsoft GCOE in Reading and then uh, Creative Assembly. And I am now a associate development manager on the Creative Assembly console team. So that's, so working in production. And I, at Creative Assembly, I've worked on Alien Isolation and Halo Wars 2 right, on the console team. And I am colorblind. My colorblindness type is severe deuteranopia. And I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail about what that means shortly. So I'm going to be covering a few different points. Uh, these are the high, these are the high notes of what I'm covering. So first, what exactly colorblindness is? I'm trying to clear up all the myths around it. Uh, common colorblindness issues in video games. So what to expect? And some some case studies and my own personal anecdotes about developing Halo Wars 2 with colorblindness and trying to understand how colorblindness affected that game. And also Colorblindness is hard to de develop for, hard to support, because it's it's quite strange, it's quite abstract. And I'm going to go into details about what's hard to understand about this. And then I'm going to give as many solutions and explore as many existing or potential solutions to the problem uh, to help all of you design and uh, design your games better for colorblindness and understand what you can do. Okay, so let's start off. So what exactly is colorblindness? So... The most succinct description I could find is the inability or decreased ability to distinguish certain colors. The word distinguish is key there. I often get asked, what color is this? And it's, or can you see this color? That's the question. And it's not actually very accurate to my problem. The problem is actually distinguishing one color from another. So I can see a color if you just hold it up. But uh, if you hold up two colors together, uh, I might not be able to distinguish them. Uh, I'll give you a sense of which ones those can be as we go. So, but before we get into color blindness, let's talk about color vision and how all of us normally see color. So, everyone has two types of photoreceptor cells in their eyes. These are the cells that receive and process light. So, we first have our rods. These are our survival cells. These detect, these detect low light. And so this is sneaking through the jungle. This is your night vision. Uh, this is how you can detect shapes moving but they don't detect colors like they're not important for that kind of cell so we haven't evolved to do that with them we have developed cones for that so our rods detect low level light our cones detect intense light and this is also where our color vision comes from and we have three types of cones we have uh, cones that receive red light cones that receive blue light and cones that receive green light and if you've got all three of these, if you're lucky enough to, and I see all the colors right, this is known as trichromacy. That's tri for three and chroma for light. So getting onto color blindness. Uh, there are many types actually, it's not just one. So we have, I'll cover the ones I can. Uh, so we have deuteronomaly, protonomaly, and tritonomaly. These are, here are the big words, these are forms of anomalous trichromacy. So trichromacy meaning you have all three cones, but anomalous meaning there is a problem with them. So, and they, uh, they cover, they affect different types of color vision. They affect the different cones. So everyone has a problem, but they, their experience is affected slightly differently. Then we have deuteronopia, which is my condition, protonopia and tritonopia. These are known as dichromacy. Effectively, we are pretty much missing one of the types of cone. And so the color bands affected are the same as anomalous trichromacy, but the extent is much more severe. There is also achromatopsia, 
Like the first thing people think when they hear colorblind is that we don't see any colors, we see in black and white. But there are some people who do see the world completely monochrome. It's very few people. It's only about, I think, one in 40,000, except in one tiny island in Micronesia called Pingalap. Um, there are actually, it's about 20% of their population is colorblind because uh, a lot of their population was wiped out a, a while ago due to a typhoon. But um, when, as the island repopulated, a uh, recessive uh, achromatopsia condition was and it spread to a lot of the population. And so now about 50 of the 250 population all see, in, all see the world in monochrome. And it's had quite an interesting effect on their culture. I don't have time to go into it, but it's worth looking up. There's a book called The Island of the Colorblind, I think, which is, I know, which is a really good source for like diving into more on this. So I'm going to focus on the dichromacy forms of colorblindness. Because um, these, if you accommodate for these, then you accommodate the vast majority of colorblindness issues. Because if you've accommodated for deuteronomy, Deuteronopia, Protonopia, and Tritonopia, it also completely solves the problems for the anomalous trichromacy conditions as well. So, first off, I'm going to start with my own. So, Deuteronopia. This is the most common type of red-green colorblindness. And there are two types of red-green, this one and Protonopia. Deuteronopia affects roughly 75% of colorblind males. So, if someone's, col so if someone's colorblind, especially if they're a man, it is probably Deuteronopia that they have. And this is a reduced sensitivity to green light. It's sometimes called green blind. And these sufferers often confuse reds, greens, and browns, blue, greens, and grays, light greens and yellows, reds, oranges, and yellows, and blues, purples, and dark pinks. It's not just mixing up red and green. Like the, the loss of the light can make so many different types of color confusing. And so much of it is all dependent on context. Moving on to protonopia. This is the other type of red-green colorblindness. And this one affects roughly 25% of colorblind males. And, uh, and I'll explain what I mean, why I'm specifically saying males and coming up. And, uh, this is a reduced sensitivity to red light. Like it's also known as red blind. And so these sufferers often confuse black with red because the intensity of red is diminished so much that it can not really appear at all. And they also have troubles with browns, greens, reds, and oranges, blues, purples, and dark pinks. And as I said before, many reds and oranges are very dim. So a key part of this, it's not like, it's not always mixing a light with another light. Sometimes a red light can not be a light at all. I'll have examples that uh, support what I mean about this coming up. Uh, finally, there's tritonopia. And tritonopia is a bit different. It's very rare for a start. It only affects roughly 1 in 10,000 people, and this affects uh, men and women equally, because uh, it's not on a sex chromosome. It's on chromosome 7, and so and it's so this is equal across the genders. And this is a reduced sensitiv sensitivity to blue and yellow light. It's also known as being blue-blind sometimes. And these sufferers often confuse blues, greens, and greys, dark purples with black, and oranges, oranges with red. You'll notice that Despite the different types of color blindness, a lot of the problems distinguishing colors, they share a lot of the problems, but it's often from the other way. So, um, someone met two color blind people. I remember in school actually, um, uh, we had these green jumpers, and for about two years, I thought they were gray. And the another color blind guy in my class, uh, we talked about it, and he said, I thought they were blue. So, two different types of color blindness, same problem area different result. Ooh, so I'm going to go into a bit of science now. So what causes color blindness? So the the sex chromosomes in uh, male, so the male sex chromosomes are X and Y. And the female sex chromosomes are 2X. So your mother will give you an X chromosome and your father will give you a let me start that again. Um, your mother will give you an X chromosome and your father will give you an X chromosome if you are born a girl or a Y chromosome if you are born a man. So these are, color, it causes colorblindness to be mostly hereditary. So it's not hereditary if it's chromosome 7 
teratinopia. So deuteranopia and protonopia are caused by a defect on the X chromosome, which means that if, uh, if you've got female chromosomes and you have a defect on one of your X chromosomes, you have another X chromosome to compensate for it. Whereas if you have male chromosomes, if you have a defect on the X, your Y chromosome cannot compensate, which is why you only need to be past one defective chromosome to have the condition. There are many women out there that are both, like they are carriers. Like, it's very rare for them to have two, two faulty X chromosomes passed to them. It also means because uh, male chromosomes are not passed from male to male. Like a father passes a Y chromosome down to their sons. A father cannot pass color blindness onto their son. So tritonopia, as I said before, is different. So this is, a, this is caused by a defect on chromosome 7, which is not a sex chromosome at all. But um, there are other, this can actually have other causes other than hereditary and uh, chromosome causes. So there are certain illnesses, injuries, and medications that can affect your and a brain that cause tritonopia. And also age. Uh, tritonopia symptoms have been involved, uh, sorry, have been observed in aging populations. Like experiments have been done that have shown these tendencies. And so there was a strong case for age causing this kind of visual deficiency. It's also different around the world, like anything hereditary. So first off, one in 12 men are colorblind approximately. So it's about 8% of the male population of the world. And uh, it's only about half a percent of the women in the world that are colorblind. But, uh, what this means is, from a gameplay point of view is in a million players, if you had a roughly 50-50 and a gender at birth split, you would statistically expect colorblindness in over 40,000 of your male players and around 2,500 of your female players. So that's 40,000 out, so that's four to 500 out of a million, which is quite a large, which is an observable chunk of people. And it's also more common in Caucasian populations. So it's been observed in approximately 10 to 11% in Scandinavian men, but only approximately 5% of Asian men and 4% of African men. And this is due to the, like, this is due to the fact that it's hereditary. So this will probably, this will probably stay the same for quite a while. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk a bit now how this has impact, this impacts my life, like what I've observed, some of the prop, some of the things that are frustrating in my life. And, um, this doesn't cover everything. There are lots of strange things that happen, um, that colorblindness causes. And I can't speak for everyone's experiences, but here are some of mine. For example, cooking meat. I often can't tell when meat is raw. So to clarify, both those pictures both those photographs look exactly the same to me. And uh, I needed a lot of help when putting this talk together to make sure I was actually showing two different photographs. But yeah, so I generally overcook meat um, just to make sure it's cooked because I can't tell visually. And uh, also, uh, I mentioned before about lights. So LEDs are very difficult to discern. So uh, like on microphones, on cameras, on computers, routers, uh, there's often like a red for a red for disconnected, a yellow for searching, and a green for everything's fine, and they all look the same to me. Um, also, uh, so I had a problem on my phone for a while. Like on my new phone, I was trying to, I was constantly hanging up on calls, and I didn't realize why. And uh, after a while, I realized I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm I'm pressing the red button because it looks green to me, and I'm getting it wrong. And even though even though the shape language is there to suggest that one of them is a phone up and the other is a phone down, even I, knowing I'm colorblind, I still instinctively respond to the color first. Color is such a fast communicator of information when it works. And also fashion, fashion is a bit of a write-off for me. Um, I, I don't know what colors work well together. I'm really pleased that most clothing has color labels, but uh, I, I don't really know what teal is. There's a lot of other names beyond colors and they, like, and I don't really know how to work with them. I mean, apparently like this, the, this man's suit is apparently some strange color. Somebody said it was burgundy and apparently burgundy exists. I'm going to have to take your word for it. Uh, 
Also, um, I'm not very good at depreciating nice things done with your hair. I probably can't tell. Like strawberry and blonde and strawberry blonde, they're, they're all kind of the same. I, I can't see it. And another thing I can't see is, is blushing. I only realized a few years ago that blushing even exists. I just thought it was something that happens in cartoons. Because I lack, I lack the light, I lack the reception to the light that changes when someone's face becomes flushed with blood. And so I had no idea it was happening. And I was really annoyed when I found out. Like, it turns out there's a whole social cue like in people's faces that I'm missing. It's kind of annoying, but, but there it is. And uh, there was, this was also a very interesting point that came up uh, about a year ago. And uh, I'm really glad the BBC called it out and everyone and other people. Um, so the football became really hard to watch for people with color blindness uh, during this game because not only were the two players kits blending into each other quite a lot, but also some of the players were blending into the pitch and it became so hard to actually distinguish what was happening in the game for so many people. And uh, there's something else I've never seen. I've never seen this. I've never seen that image of me as you're seeing it right there. I don't identify with it. I've never seen it. Maybe I never will. I identify with that. Right, so I am, um, my skin is more of a green. And uh, that's actually how I see all of you as well. So pretty much everyone's skin is a similar kind of green because I, I, uh, I lose the beiges, I lose the browns, I lose every, like, everything. Everyone's the same kind of, well, as you see it. In fact, and beyond my own color blindness, looking at how people with protonopia and tritonopia, like if you have a friend who has protonopia or tritonopia, this is how they see you. And this is how they see themselves. The world is very different. When I was young, I had to be told, actually told, that people don't have green skin because I couldn't tell from observation. A very surreal time. And so I'm going to look into a few myths. So there are a few myths around what, what, behind what colorblind people can and can't do. So I'm going to address just a few of those. Uh, first off, can you drive? Uh, like, fair question. Traffic lights are all color based. And um, it is the case that the red and the amber lights look really similar to me, but, but the green lights are fine. And so, and because of the way the pattern has been designed, I can actually make this work even at nighttime. If I see one light that is not green, so if it may be, if it's either red or yellow, it still means stop, be prepared to stop. The green is still distinct. And if there are two lights, it's about to be green. So, so I'm good, I can still drive and, I, and the traffic lights are not a problem. Another common one, uh, can colorblind people be pilots? Uh, this question was, I think, popularized again in the film Little Miss Sunshine. And the answer to this one, it's a maybe. Uh, it, depends on, it depends on your kind of colorblindness and the intensity of it. And so from what I can research, the uh, Air Force and such or any um, flight schools, they will test you specifically they will test you specifically to see if your color blindness is getting in the way of you being able to read the signals that they use. So if you're colorblind, you want to be a pilot, don't let it put you off applying, um, but be prepared for them to test you to see if there is actually a problem. So it's time to find out. Okay. Uh, many of you may recognize this image. Right, this is that dress. So some of the people, the dress that people could not agree, like, is it blue and black or is it white and gold and um some people asked well, what do you see well i it kind of looks the same to me and it was um it was equally confusing it's like and i think i see the i think i actually see it as a kind of blue and bronze i don't know if that's unnatural but this was so very funny like this was one of the best weeks of my life because like it's like for a whole week the whole world was colorblind right? and had no idea what to do about it because, and, it, and uh, I realized, like, I'm actually, I'm comfortable, like, uh, I've grown up, I can't remember not knowing I was colorblind. We found that very early. Like, you draw a whale in a purple sea and then argue that the sea is blue like, in school, people find out quickly that you're colorblind. But um, what this meant is I'm used to the idea that what I see might be wrong. Like, what the image that my eyes give me uh, might not be the truth. And so I'm 
comfortable with that idea? Most people aren't. Most people are not used to being see being deceived by their own eyes. And it was really interesting and seeing this, seeing the whole world have to confront this, this strange realization. Um, for me, it was a lot of fun. All right, let's talk about video games. So this is, this is not an exhaustive list. Like these are just some of the common colorblindness issues in video games. So and you have a start, start thinking about the games you make, the games you play, and think about where team colors are used. Think about how your UI and your characters and your environment are distinguished from each other. Think about, do your puzzles use color? Do you communicate UI information with color? Like start time we start time we can think about those. I'm going to show you some examples of where these have become where these have been problematic in my experiences. So um, first off, let's talk about team colors. So uh, this is a shot from this was Battlefield Three, and uh, I was always a big fan of Battlefield, um, like the multiplayer. So Battlefield Two, Twenty One Forty Two, I had a great time for so long, and um, I was excited for Battlefield Three. And when it came out, I couldn't tell who my enemies were. Like uh, they, like uh, the colours had been changed. I think during the bat Bad Company two times, that um, the enemies and friendlies. So, what were the colours? So I think it was now friendlies that weren't in your squad were still blue, and that was clear. But enemies and your squad mates being in, I'm not even sure if they're oranges and greens. I just couldn't tell. And so, and people are fast in that game. Like, I don't have time to figure out contextually. Like, is that is that an enemy or is that a friendly? He's already spotted me and shot me. And so, I I couldn't play the game. And the colorblind modes did come out, but it was it was nine months after release, and it was like I couldn't wait for that. It was like uh, I'd already moved on, and uh, I was a bit sad about that. Uh, another one. So this is this time Overwatch as an example. Uh, so this is about this is about distinguishing uh, different elements so the ui the characters and the environment are all very colorful in overwatch but they're not always distinct and overwatch is such a fast moving such a busy game it's so easy for like a and a like the red aura on reaper and it kind of disappears a lot and so you can't see it doesn't pop out i'm not 100 percent sure if he's an enemy or a friendly and the UIs just kind of disappear into the background. And so it's, and it becomes a real mess. It's so much information happening at once and I can't grasp it quick enough. And it really does affect how I play the game. You'll notice in this shot that I'm playing Anna. Uh, so my character choices were actually influenced by my colorblindness. So the advantage of Anna is if she shoots a friendly, she heals them. If she shoots an enemy, she hurts them. So I, I would just keep firing at somebody and think that, well, I'm, I'm helping somebody. Um, of course, I prioritize healing. Right. And also, Orisa. Um, Orisa has an ability where it's called Halt, where it pulls all her enemies into a in an area into a certain place. It's usually used for repositioning, occasionally dropping people off stuff. I also used it for just, I know, I know, just filtering a, a team fight so I knew who to shoot. Because like lots of people fighting, I'm like, right, I'm gonna split off the enemies there. Okay, I'm shooting you guys. Because uh, I couldn't tell from the UI. <laughs> um, let's talk about puzzles. <sighs> puzzles are obviously uh, going to be trouble because there are so much, so much color matching, and it seems it's such an intuitive device to use. And I absolutely understand why it's been used, and it's just a shame. Like in in the puzzle game and the one below, I I can't even tell you how many colors are in that. Like it is, it's just information I can't use. Uh, there are lots of there are lots of puzzles which use as well as a color language, they, they combine it with a shape language, and this is excellent. This is exactly the way to do it. And then let's put UI information. UI is complicated in so many ways before you even start using color. And it's such an easy way. It's a very intuitive way, like green to red as a good to bad. It's a very intuitive um, system, but only if you can see it. So for example, this is a uh, this is from MechWarrior 3, I believe, and the those colors are used to uh, to clarify damage. So the greens are, this is a healthy part of the mech, the yellows are, this has taken some shots, and the red is, this is about to fall off and you're going to die. And for me, it's it can actually get really hard to distinguish 
like all of these, like the greens from the reds, the greens from the I know yellows, or is it yellow or is it orange? I don't actually know. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but it's it's information that's very difficult for me to use. And uh, similarly, this is a apparently these colors are mapped to the Xbox buttons. And, uh, I was I was testing this game uh, Fable Three, and I didn't realize that these were mapped to the buttons because I couldn't see I couldn't see a red in there. Um, and uh, and this is a timing puzzle. This is fast. I've got to be able to react quickly, and it's designed to be intuitive. But again, it's uh, it's a language I can't see. And I didn't even I didn't even realize there was a color language to the uh, materia in Final Fantasy VII. Um, I just they they had colors like I didn't really know if they meant anything. But um, I I guess it denotes categories, but I can't distinguish them. I don't really know. So, let's take a moment. Oh, okay, right. Uh, so, I'm going to now talk in focus about Halo Wars 2. So, there were different... Okay. Uh, so, there were some problems in the Halo Wars 2 color perception. And uh, I wasn't able to... I wasn't able to actually ensure that our game was colorblind friendly. And I'm going to talk about some of that why. So first I'll explain some of the issues that we did have. So uh, for those who don't know, Halo Wars 2 is a real-time strategy set in the Halo Wars, in the Halo universe. And color was used across a lot of our features. And so where, where we had some problems, or at least where I had some problems in the game, were in our team colors, in our minimap, in our campaign choice of colors, in the and in the UI in our blitz cards. So the image there is showing our blitz mode where you have the cards that are used to play different units onto the battlefield. It's a very quick mode. So first off, I'm going to talk about team colors. So these are so here's a bunch of Scorpion tanks, one from every all of our six teams. And the color here was used to imply two things. One, which units are yours? But two, there was also a soft coloring system to split across which team they are. So it was 3v3. This was very difficult for me to use. So first off, the I think there are orange, red, and yellow tanks. If I see them in isolation, I don't know if they're my unit or not. And also on the other side, that green tank in the center, visually to me, it looks more like it's on the same team as the red, orange, and yellow than it does on the blue slash purple side, or is it blue, dark blue? I'm not sure. Um, but it's not clear to me. Like, and in a, an inner fight, like on a battlefield, I can't tell whether they're my units and, or, or my teammates' units or, or an enemy unit. So I, I couldn't make that distinction. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, the minimap as well was, it was the same color, similar color information but even smaller and there was so much information being given that it was really difficult for me to pull the like figure out what was going on and this uh hits the same problem earlier of the information in context so the dark blues here could easily just fade into the background map and i can't see them at all or the really light blues or light greens um like this is this is a magnified mini map they can often just look like the same kind of white or pale as the UI, like as the map layout itself. Like I'm not even sure if it's a unit at all. And so the minimap was difficult for me to use. I could often tell something was happening, but not what. Um, okay, I'm going to make a bit of a game of this next bit. So here is a screenshot from our campaign as I see it. Uh, this is your base. There are, t there are enemies attacking it. Your base is under attack. Can you tell me where they are? Give you a moment to look, see if you can figure out. There are two. And how about now? This is the shot without the colorblind filter. And they should be pretty easy, I expect. So those two units on the left are, yeah, those are the two attacking locusts. And uh, it took me a while to realize during development that we, and uh, that our enemy, that the enemy units were being displayed on the minimap and that the colors we had chosen for the enemies and friendly teams were so similar to me. I actually didn't realize we were showing enemies at all. 
because it was also similar. Uh, one more. So our blitz card UI. So you see the you see the icons in the center of the card are used to denote how effective they are against infantry, vehicles, and aircraft. So the man, the wheel, and the plane. And if you look at this, what is your intuition? I can ask yourself, do I think this is effective against an uh, infantry, vehicles, aircraft? What do you get from those colors? To me, it looks like, oh, it's, it's yellow against, it looks like it's yellow, so medium against infantry, yellow and medium against uh, vehicles, and red, bad against aircraft. And that's not true. Uh, I believe it's a green against infantry, but, uh, but I couldn't really tell. I couldn't actually make use of this. So we also had a very complex palette in our game. It's like there, was, there were so many things happening at the same time and so many elements to try and balance uh, that it was in general just such a noisy and complicated game for me to read. So uh, for example, in, that sec in the first shot, I believe there, I think there is a big red hue surrounding a lot of the uh, locust units, but um, I, I, didn't know, I didn't even know that existed. It was so hard for me to tell whose units they were. I would usually go all units and count just to see if I had any units left in the fight. Because there's often six, six factions all fighting at once. Loads and loads of things. Right. Okay, so um, before, I, before I move on to the next section, I'm just going to take one question. So, a uh, question from the chat here. What would you say is an example of a game or games that do accessibility for colorblindness the best? Any standout ones that come to mind that really impressed you with their implementation and support for different colorblindness types? So I do have some answers to that coming up later in the slides. So that's, that's going to be my best way to answer the question. So I'll be getting to that shortly. Thank you very much for asking. Please keep the questions coming. So, so we had these problems with color in Halo Wars 2. Um, but I was there. I'm colorblind. Why couldn't I help, uh, why couldn't I help find all of these? And there is a reason for this. So the problem is the problem itself is of course invisible to normal sighted developers. You don't like if you're not colorblind, you don't know there's a problem. Like uh, to use the old phrase, it works on my machine. But um but for the colorblind, the features themselves are often invisible. Like and so who starts the conversation? So I've got an example from one of our games. So I was fortunate enough to work on Alien Isolation. And uh, those, of you, those of you that played it will remember the working Joe androids. And uh, I was, so I was a tester at the time and I was often, so testing levels and I would be going around hiding from these androids so they don't come over and strangle me. But um, there was one time where I made a mistake and one of them caught me and I expected him to attack, but he just said, good day. I, like, I thought you were an aggressive android. And this, this bothered me. I was thinking, man, it would be really nice if there were a way to tell that the androids were aggressive. Of course there is. I, of course, like their eyes glow red if they, are in a, if they are in an aggressive state. But I had no idea. I had no idea there was an eye glow at all. And by the time I figured it out, like by the time I realized or it came up in a conversation somehow, I didn't even know how that conversation happened. Um, it was too late like we were already in the release phase and there wasn't time like there wasn't time for us to rethink the feature and rework it and so that was where the problem was invisible to everyone else but the feature was invisible to me and so there was no one to start the conversation um similarly uh and again in my career testing connect star wars while i was at microsoft so um there is a pod racing mode, which has the racing line that's very common in all, like uh, Forza, Grid, uh, all these, all the racing games, they use this. And they use a very similar language, which I was asked to test. And that is, does it go red in the braking zones correctly? To which I asked, wait, it does what? Like, and yeah, apparently this is the standard way racing lines work. Like uh, if you're colorblind, this might surprise you that this happens. So it's, I think they're green in when you want to be at your fastest, yellow maybe for a bit of a turn, and red in a braking zone. And I had, I had no idea this happened. I just thought it was this yellow line that ran throughout the entire track. And uh, the, so this test case happened to come to me. That's the only way I found out. And uh, I brought it up, but it, it was too late to redo a system. 
and it was also they said to me well other games do it this way like and i was like they do and um it was it was too late to solve the problem from finding out the feature existed so there is a way to solve this and there are a lot of ways to solve uh color blindness issues so i'm going to talk i'm going to talk through what i can on this so we've so the first thing you can do when thinking about how to make your games colorblind friendly is don't just use color for information. So I called out some of the games earlier that I mentioned that some games earlier, and I've got some examples that use shape language as well. That's a really good example, shape or text, or well, if you can think of anything else. For some guidance to this, um, in web design, they have the WCAG, the Web Contents Accessibility Guidelines. These are what long, well-established guidelines of how to make a website accessible. And uh, in developing games, we can learn from that. Like a lot of this research has already been discussed. And, uh, and here's that word distinguishing again. So if, and it, so if something is meant to show up, like if, and if, a light, if it's like a light is coming on in your design, make sure that the background can't be confused with that light or it might feel like no light at all. Um, you can also think and about your colors from the very beginning. So um, a lot of games have very complicated palettes, and, um, but you can, but there are ways to do this. So if you want to screenshot this or go to that URL, um, these color palettes are really, these have been figured out to be distinguishable for people of all these key color blindness types. Um, I don't know if they account for achromatopsia, for the monochrome. Um, I'm not sure about that. I can't vouch it. Uh, so, but there are resources available if you go looking for these. And uh, this is a good standard practice. Um, like this is a good way to make, make your games really visible from the start. But games are complicated. We're changing them all the time. We're coming up with new features, new ideas, new ways of communicating. And like with new ideas come brand new problems. And so this doesn't cover everything. So if you want two things distinguished from each other, use blue and orange. Everybody can see it. This is an example from Portal. And uh, I, I, never, like, uh, I never even thought, ah, oh, these are distinguished by color. They're gonna be difficult to me. They were just obvious, clear as day, day and night. And so if in doubt, use blue and orange. Um, the key part is understanding the color in your game. So it's really important to identify your color features. And so I'm gonna throw a quick list at you. Like there are some things you don't, you might not even realize that are a color feature. So your puzzles are probably color features. Uh, your maps. So there's the Sea of Thieves map with the infinite, infamous red X and uh, to mark the treasure that I could never see, but they now have a colorblind uh, solution for that. Thank you so much Rare for putting that in. Uh, are you using color in your UI to communicate information? And are your teams colored? And are your items distinguished by color? And that, do you have colored lights? And this is from Freelancer. Like I got killed by so many pirates because I didn't realize the up lane and down lane and in these uh, trade lanes was marked by different colors. And are you using it in text? I mean, in my, I actually think this is personally quite a good example because uh, the, the red and the blue are like similar to the orange and blue very clear to distinguish, but, but think about your text and what color are you using? It might not all work. And also is your palette just really complex? Like, I know, are the different elements like potentially blending into each other? Uh, you have to, un to solve the issues, you have to understand them. But, so you can make things easier for your team if you have figured out and that's some of these by setting up presets. So um, if you're, so if you want a team color to be established by something, um, so you figure out the categories, you figure out the information you're going to want to communicate with this and then have these colors set as presets in whatever your developing system is, because you don't want your artists to have to figure out, uh, how they're getting the information across. Like, uh, if you want to communicate, if you want them to be able to communicate, this is on somebody's team, this is on the enemy team, like let, let them set it as a preset so they can, so they can carry on with the aesthetic of, and a, and the rest of their job. So, and you can use the color safe palettes demonstrated a few slides ago to make sure that these work and do test them. So test the presets at work in the context of your game. 
because they may be distinguishable from each other. Do they, are they distinguishable from the environment and the background? And you want to make it as easy as possible for your team to accommodate your players. Uh, and this can be, and this can allow for systemic, systemic management of, and of the support. So I recommend using simulators as well, like, and I keep trying to understand and see where this is. So Color Oracle, there's loads of software. Here's just a few. So Color Oracle, it's a free simulator. Unity has a package which allows you to and see your game and that in a colorblind view. Unreal, again, has a color vision deficiency preview. Photoshop has a simulator. Uh, there is a real-time simulator called Sim Daltonism. There are Chrome plugins. And this one is the one I have been using to generate all the colorblind filtered images that you've been seeing in this talk. Like it's a really easy thing to just drag and drop a picture in and you can try the different types of colorblindness across it. So, sorry. Right, and um, this next part is this next part is key. So, if you remember earlier, um, I said that sometimes the it you don't know who's going to start the conversation, like and the people that can't see the feature or the people that can't see the problem. As a as a developer, it's going to have to be you. You have to understand the like you have to understand your game, and then reach out to people with the problem and invite them to come and view it. So you probably have color, if you're in a, uh, even a slightly large studio, uh, it's, there are probably colorblind colleagues or you have probably have colorblind friends and they like, like me, they want this stuff to work for them. They want to be able to play the games. Like, and so they will, I've never met anyone that wasn't keen to help out. And so, and I please reach out to them and try and discuss how your game is supposed to work and they should be able to help you make it accessible. So, uh, so this comes back to answering the question earlier. So here are some examples of some color solutions and some games that do it really well. And they're solving different color problems as well. So this gives you a good example of and how color, color blindness can make some certain games difficult in a variety of different ways and then exactly how to make it and it work for them. So first off, uh, we have Hue. Uh, Hue is like the name gives it away it is all about color so it is about matching your kind of your kind of color set from your wheel to the environment to solve puzzles make objects disappear reappear and if this would if this if i try to play this game just as it is it would be impossible like so you can see like some of these colors just are just completely going to blend together uh, i didn't even know what to call those um but but i never i never had trouble and I went trying to play this game. It was completely, it was completely readable because they had from a start made sure that their colorblind mode worked and their, they had these logos and a, in every patch of color. And so the game is instantly readable for me. This is solving the problem brilliantly. Next, Left 4 Dead. So they have player auras around the friendlies and enemies it's like it's a dark game you need these just to see where anything or anybody is and uh there you can so there is a jockey sat on top of a, a friendly so it's an enemy on top of a friendly to my eyes those look completely the same but left 4 dead i was pleased to see launched with a colorblind mode and uh i remember finding it on launch i, I can't remember if i went looking for it I, but i remember finding it straight away i turned it on and i never ever had a problem playing the game so i can see right i can see enough information here so on the right we have uh, a friendly that is at full health on the left we have two enemies that are on a very low health and we and there is an enemy about to land on one of them and for me it is absolutely clear like it is like it is clear distinguished from each other and they are clearly distinguished from the environment this is solving the problem really really well so next up we have ftl faster than light so this uses color all over the ui and so there are there are different things being shown um so there are different statuses and there are also like so different things being a higher or lower status like well powered or damaged and there are also rooms so if you look at the rooms at the rear of that spaceship you can see some of them are and they're kind of getting redded out and some of them are 
that means they're running out of oxygen. So the oxygen is off in those rooms or they're exposed. But I can't always see that. Um, but again, they launch with the colorblind mode. And now the, ox the deoxygenated rooms are crosshatched. So I can, it's a pattern change. When that comes on, I know instantly oxygen is not there. And so, and I can see the others. So they, all the other different UI, they have changed the color scales so much. I don't know what to call those colors, like reds, greens, or whatever, but, but I can clearly see which ones are damaged and which ones are not. So, and I can even see which ones are off. So this is, uh, this is a fantastic solution to what was before a very complicated color problem. So they've done really well. And uh, then we have, I'm, pl I'm pleased to say, uh, at Creative Assembly, we have been doing some work on this ourselves. So Warhammer 2, our teams and statuses are distinguished by color. And uh, in Warhammer, in Total War Warhammer 2, we introduced colorblind mode for the first time. And uh, in my opinion, it works. So I, I'm going to show you an example of how. So the norm. So this is a battlefield without any colorblind mode. And for me, it's very difficult to distinguish the armies. The UI is very similar. And so with the colorblind mode, it now shifts the friendly army from the same kind of red gold type thing and a two or more of a blue green. So I can actually distinguish my enemies and friendlies in combat. So, <sighs> sorry. And this comes, so I mentioned text earlier, how text colors can be difficult. So we have here, we have like the statuses of different units and they are distinguished by different levels of green, yellow. I'm not completely sure. Um, it's, it's hard for me to see. Funny enough, when, uh, I, when I first prepared this talk and was practicing with people, this was one I had accidentally put the same picture there twice. That is how similar these two pictures are to me right now. But with the colorblind mode, it all completely changes. So we have, so I can now see that the eager, like active, fresh, I can see that those are good. Um, I can see that the tired is definitely bad and that wind is really bad. Um, and so now I can make, so I can now make decisions about and as quick as everybody else about what to do with my units and how ready they are for more fighting and, and, and where they're at. So I'm, so I'm really, I'm really pleased with the way that they've been in, able to implement the colorblind mode in Total War Warhammer 2. So, uh, I'd like, I'd like to just respond to a couple of comments that have come through. So. First comment, I've seen that Destiny 2 has colorblind settings, but I'm not sure of its effectiveness. So um, I haven't actually, so I haven't actually played Destiny 2 or um, tried out their colorblindness mode either. Um, so I'm not, I'm afraid I can't actually comment on that one. Um, I'd be, it would be interested to see. So um, in, men, in a lot of games, if the colorblind modes don't work, the forums will probably be quite active with it. So it's probably good, like, um, see if the Destiny uh, 2 community has actually been talking about the colorblind modes and uh, see what their players have been saying. Uh, another, com another comment, Planetside 2 has their entire UI color scheme customizable from a huge palette where every type of information communicated can be bound to a different color in such a way as the player wants. I haven't played Planetside 2 either, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear that. So customizing the color scheme and giving that control to the player is exactly the way I think solving the colorblindness is uh, accommodating colorblindness can be done. So I have examples of other games that have done that system, but I'm really pleased to hear that there are more games that are doing it this way. So I'm going to move on to some of the other games that do this. So first off, coming back to Overwatch. So Overwatch has had an interesting journey with their colorblindness modes. So first off, what are the problems? So they have different colors marking out and it's mostly about who's on your team. And also the alert is for when you've been snagged by an Anna grenade. So if somebody's vulnerable, but as I showed you, these blend into each other so much, they are so hard to see the difference. Um, but there was initially a colorblind mode, but it didn't really work. Like um, it's, and it made um, things stand out easier from the background, but it was really hard to distinguish the difference. UI types from each other. Uh, 
it actually it actually made it a bit harder. Um, there is a there is a streamer called Colorblind, um, Colorblind with a K, uh, and they've done some really good some really good in depth analysis videos showing what different parts of the game are I know get made worse by some of the colorblind modes. Um, I have there have been changes to their colorblind modes I know fairly recently which have improved it a lot and I get uh, I'll come back to that in a bit. So audio surf. So now we get now we're getting onto the really fun part and a bit like with Planet Side 2, this is allowing the user to select the colors. So these are so in audio surf, you sometimes have to be distinguishing between five different colors. It is so hard to find five different colors that people with all different types of color vision will actually distinguish. And so they were wise enough to not decide to do that and let the players figure it out for themselves. So all these five I know, traffic colors, you, you have RGB sliders to make the decision all for yourself. And so I was able to make this and that's the color scheme I chose, like shown there on the right. I'm able to make this completely distinguishable for me. I can make it work for me. That's the key part, because the user knows, and so you can let you can let them do the work. Like similarly, I didn't know if these were designed to be colorblind friendly or not. But the fact that I could choose my team colors in Worms Armageddon or in Red Alert or in similar games, um, particularly if I was playing with friends, they um, like they could let me choose first. And I could choose the colors that look nothing like any of the others to make sure my all my gameplay elements were distinguishable. And coming back and coming back to Overwatch, this is the colorblind. This is how their colorblind mode works now. So they've given the players control of the different color types. So I can now ensure that my enemies and friendlies are distinct from each other. At the time I took the screenshot, you couldn't actually choose the group color which I found very strange and it did lock me into having the enemies and friendlies kind of the other way around to how I wanted them. I would ideally like to be able to make the enemies the yellow because it stands out so much from the environment and, uh, my, and then have my friendlies and, group, and groups be kind of the same. In the battle, I don't really care if someone's in my group or if they're just someone else on my team like while looking. And oh, there's another question from the chat. So you mentioned that blue and orange was a good rule of thumb. Are there any good rules of thumb for sets of three or more colors? So for me, I have, it's a hard one that like, and I can only, this one I can only really answer for me. Um, so for me as a Deuteranopia, so I find that a, keeping a red, so like a red, a yellow and a blue are often good but it's really hard to say um, because depending on how it's shown, like if they're just matte, like painted colors, that works. But if it's LED, it stops working. Red, reds and yellows start to look the same. So it's really hard to, it's uh, three is already a really difficult uh, set to accommodate for. So uh, I don't actually have a good answer for that. Um, I recommend uh, I recommend looking into some of the palettes like I showed earlier from the people who've done the research because I, I'm not sure like what to offer here. I might look into that note. So thank you for giving me that idea. So, so this is a slide. I, this is a couple of slides I'm really pleased to be able to show. So coming back to Battlefield again that I had so much trouble with before. So Battlefield 4 launched with colorblind modes, which was good. Like uh, from launch, they had like four and onwards. They had settings for Deuteranopia, Tritonopia, Protonopia, which is really good. But they have they have outdone themselves with this. Like for me, I think this is the gold standard of and that colorblind support. And uh, well, I need to check out Planet Side too. Um, is they let you choose. They and they give you the enemy, the friendly, and the neutral colors, and you can get through a whole hue graph and make sure it's going to work with you. Because not only are you distinguished from the environment. But you are like, and you are distinguished from each other. You can make you can make sure it's going to work perfectly for you. And the, I am so pleased to see this. There are other methods. So, and uh, maybe maybe you actually just I know you don't need to care about color sometimes. Like maybe I know just being able to customize your character and do and 
give players some shape language that they can apply um, is enough. I don't even think this was done to make these colorblind accessible, but it works. So for example, when playing Gang Beasts, like I don't actually have to know or care what color my characters are. I just have to know that I'm the chicken. Good. Or if I'm playing Star Wars, I, all I have to know is that I'm the one with the sombrero. I, I don't care what the color is. I can play the game absolutely fine. Now, uh, something I I want to talk about Fortnite's accessibility for a bit, and uh, I I really like what they've done here because not only do the do they have colorblind support features, but they have made them accessible in two ways. One, so their menu they have an accessibility menu which is easy to find. It's a top level menu, and uh, that means like if so audio surf for example i didn't have a um i didn't find that it feature immediately i played it for a while and just in mono mode because i didn't think it supported color blindness then i happened to stumble across um and i happened to stumble across the color controls and that changed everything whereas in fortnite you can see immediately that there's a, there are accessibility features so a lightning rod to it and deal with it and also the way they've done it so these, there's there's a lot of young players playing Fortnite. They might not know they're colorblind, and uh, there are people that this have, has helped um, find out. So they used the llama in an Ishihara plate test, which is what these dot circles are called, Ishihara. And people can play with the things until they can see all the llamas well. They don't have to understand how colorblindness works, um, and they can just keep but uh, they can still make use of the feature. And, and it's, as I said, it's helped some people realize, oh, maybe I actually have a color deficiency problem. So I think this is absolutely fantastic. There's been some fun stuff for this as well. So um, it's, it's worth thinking as well, this can help make games more visually, visually accessible as well as just uh, for colorblind. So, I was at a conference, um, the Game Accessibility Conference in San Francisco, and there was a live transcription. And <laughs> this was initially for people, this system is set up while someone's talking, someone is typing out everything they say. And this is for people with um, auditory problems. But at one point, the word blushing came up. And I realized, aha, I actually know that someone on stage is blushing. I wouldn't have known past that. But um, it's worth thinking. But it's worth thinking, if you're thinking about colorblindness deficiency, think about all visual deficiencies. Like think about everything you can do to make your game can be a game to be improved visually. Because it helps more people than just the colorblind. It helps people with achromatopsia. It helps people with low vision. Like, and it helps people with cataracts. It helps people with brain injuries. Like it helps people with impaired hearing who rely so much on the visuals being clear and it helps people with cognitive disabilities for whom like an in, information intake and overload can be completely disabling so all of these things can be helped by i know just taking some time to think and can and talk to people and that anyone else you can think of about how they how they find your game so i'm very short on time i'm gonna and just uh, i think i can just about get the last bits in so fun facts about fortnite there's a lot of people using their colorblind settings far more than are colorblind. A lot of people are using the Tritonopia setting, but that's hardly anyone. That's one in 10,000 people. What's going on? And it turns out it just makes it easier to find. It just makes it easier to find everything. Like things stick out more. So this is a really good example of seeing what people need from their games. So I'm just going to bump into, I'm just going to wrap this up uh, quite quickly now. So there, if you take one screenshot, it's this one. So these are the key steps for supporting colorblindness. So just don't, don't just communicate with color. Try to understand your game, your palette, and your color features. Uh, use the preview tools that are out there. There are plenty. Your, if you can, set up a color preset system. And think about wide-reaching solutions. As I said, think, think about things that can help as many of your players as possible. And it's up to you to find the best solution for your game because if like, you're creating a brand new game you're creating brand new problems <laughs> so it's time for some brand new solutions and test them like uh there are like you've probably got friends players colleagues like if you've got a community ask them like ask them and uh, do you have uh problems with our features 
and make the options accessible. So, and they, like, um, like with Fortnite, they have their accessibility menu. Make it easy for people to play your game. And, and yeah, and talk to your community. Like, I know you might not know what problems they, you might not realize that there are problems in your game you can solve and they might not feel, they might not feel they'll be taken seriously if they ask. So start the conversation yourselves. Like, is there, are there any accessibility things we can do for you? And it's, it's so valuable. Like, even though some people make mistakes when, uh, trying to put colorblind modes together, it is so, it is really heartwarming. It's really like you know, energizing whenever anyone tries. Like, uh, this is my problem. This is not so many other people's problem. And so for me, I love it when I'm so gratified whenever, is that the word gratified? When people do this to try and help me. So thank you to, thank you to everyone that's watching this. And thank you to anyone that is trying to make games more accessible. So thanks very much. There are a couple of links there on screen uh for like uh, some more information from colorblind awareness again that's the simulator i use and uh the third one is a um the third one is a phone-based simulator i use to show people how it all looks from my angle so all that's left to say is thank you for watching this bafta games live stream and watch this space for future tutorials thank you so much